Uh, it doesn't. Don't need it because I'm recording my screen with on my computer, and I won't write on the blackboard probably. Cool. Well, three whole students, one of whom knows more than me, I think. Um, but anyway, I thought this week we could talk about some how to actually have like a common thing that I've been asked is the kind of mindset that you use and the techniques you follow, like the process you follow to go through to actually solve competitions like Sesco. So Neil will tell me off if I get it wrong, I'm sure. So uh, yeah. I just kind of wrote some words down and didn't think what I was going to say, so that's good. So I guess when you're actually solving a problem in Sesco or a competition like that, you need to kind of have a strategy and be thorough. You can't just randomly throw yourself at it and go, oh, I'm going to try this, I'm going to try this. Like, it, if you don't do things thoroughly and if you don't document what you do, it's not going to be much use because often in size scale or league CTS, the problems are really huge and take like four or five or ten of you working on it to solve it. And it takes you like a whole day to solve. So there are some problems that have a really huge scope. So recording what you find and sort of having a strategy and thinking things through is a really good approach to take. So a common thing that you'll start off is you'll start by exploring around the system. So you'll try and work out like what, like try and get a feel for all of the pages on a website or all of the functions of a program and try and see, you know, what are there, th what things are there here that might possibly be vulnerable. So I guess once you have a kind of a mental map of what's going on inside a problem, then it's a good way to get started. And then once you've done that, you can test out some common techniques. So you might have like a program that will detect SQL injections or XSS, or you can try you know, putting quotes in text boxes and that sort of thing. Um, or you can try spamming it with lots of data, so like catting dev random to a net cat pipe or something and seeing if it crashes. Like it's a valid way to do. It's a valid thing to do. You can also try sending, sending no data and seeing if that crashes it as well. So yeah, I guess have in your mind common techniques that you can use and try them So a thing that I keep talking about is that you kind of need to put yourself in the mind of the programmer who's going to be writing this program and thinking, what assumptions could I make if I was doing this? So if you're making, I don't know, a website and you've got like a radio box, you take a, you can you know select one of three things, and it can't be, you know, it's going to be one or two or three or none. It can't be two of them, and it can't be random text. Um, but so a programmer might think, oh, I don't need to you know, validate this input. It's just going to be. A, text box thing, like they can't type things in themselves. But of course that sort of assumption is something that we can target and we can, you know, inject data like it shows the web week through the proxy or like book or something. So assumptions like that, anything where you might try and simplify, because the world is very complicated and programming is very complicated and you kind of try and have these constraints on your mind to try and simplify things down so that you can imagine it because programming is not easy but a kind of But programming is hard, and so people make mistakes a lot. Um, that was my third point. But my second point is like, yeah, try and imagine the programmer who's writing this code, and then try and go one level up. So think, you know, what do they do, and how can I take advantage of that? And of course, humans aren't perfect, and there's there's always deadlines, there's always constraints. Like in the real world, code is written terribly because people, you know, they have these perfect ideals and think, oh, it's going to be so secure, and then. At the end of the day, hello. hello. Um, at the end of the day, they have deadlines or they run out of money or whatever. So problems happen. Um, I've just been rambling about problem solving stuff, but it's in the video. So cool. And also, tools are really useful. Like reinventing the wheel is a silly thing to do. So have a play around at some point with Kali or Backtrack, which are like distributions of Linux that you can use to hack things. So they've got like I don't know a million, maybe not a million but like hundreds of hacking tools that you can use and are uh, pretty useful. So make sure you've played around with one of those and kind of have a feel for the tools it has. Um, know how to Google is really important. Often in competitions you'll find some half-written software that solves your problem halfway and then you can modify that to make it actually work. I remember, was it the, what's the, like the Korean one? Mm -hmm. The heats for that? And then you guys were doing the, Python bytecode stuff by hand, and I was writing the tool to yeah, yeah, yeah. finish at the exact same moment. That was really cool. So they were trying, like, we had some Python bytecode, and we had to turn that back into a Python program. 
And so the other people on my team were you know, trying to understand the Python bytecode and reading it by hand and turning it into code. And I was like, oh, I found this tool online that'll do it. So I, it wasn't working, so I modified the tool and you know, patched it to make it work. And so it, we finished it the exact same moment. It was like poetic. <laughs> it was really cool. Yeah, but just Googling stuff, like if you have a filter, then like if comments are being filtered, then Google for a filter of Asian GT or that sort of thing. And make sure you're familiar with the common tools in advance. So some of the ones I can think of is Burp Suite, which is the proxy I've shown you. Ida, which is for disassembling, which I'll show at some point. Um, an SQL map for SQL injections, and then YH arc for reading network epics and stuff. Um, cool, so I was gonna go into some live demos, it's just sacrificing people demo gods. Uh, so I showed Harry Crypto one last week, but do you mind if we do it again? Yeah, I think it's a good example. Um, just move these chairs. So, yeah, I'll look at it and then. So the, the strategy, like the hints for this, is have a play around, see what patterns you can see, and then how can you use them to your advantage. So, I haven't prepared this earlier very much. It was working before, so hopefully it's still working. Um, so this is like the size school website and so you normally have problems with points that they're worth and there's some text. So they're saying, you know, evaluate the custom encryption used in our secure shell, identify vulnerabilities and then exploit them to gain confidential information. And this is where the server's running. So, can you guys read that okay? Yeah. Cool. Turn Maybe turn the lights off? Yeah. yeah. Hello. Hey. Cool. So, we have a program. What do we want to do next? Not Harry, because not Oliver, because you've seen it, but like, what are you guys thinking? What, what should we type in? Type help. Alright. Uh. Whoa. <laughs> okay, so it's running command help and then it's a bunch of random output uh there's some patterns i guess hello so look, there's a bunch of m's all right what should we do next oh it says key reset down the bottom that's important okay so if you're on help on your own computer the answer spaces so uh yeah so maybe it's running a shell in the background <coughs> and executing commands but it's not really useful because it's all encrypted, so I mean, M is space, sure, but that doesn't really help us. You did see this last week, so don't freak out. All right, so what should we try next? Yes. Yeah, so like I, I think we should run help again and see what happens because you know, if it happens once, like it's a scientist, right? Gets struck by lightning and goes, oh, I wonder if it'll happen again if I push this button again. <laughs> so, running help again, now we have S's instead of M's, so, like, the, the physical pattern on the page looks pretty similar, right? So what are you guys thinking so far? Not the people who have seen the answer. <laughs> I don't remember this challenge. I, I don't think I did it. I think I did this one. Were you on my Saisuke team? Yeah. yeah. So obviously encrypting all the output and resetting that every time. Yep. Every time we run a command. But it's a crap encryption. Yeah? Why is it crap? <laughs> because the, the repeated S's it must be using the same, it's a cipher. Mm. A transpositions, uh, a substitution cipher. Yep. Last so time you showed the source code, it probably made it a bit easier. Ah, oh, the source code, I remember this. Um, source code? Some source code, not the whole thing. So... <laughs> Um, you can see there's a like there's some stuff cut out. There's an execute command function which shows it does indeed run bash. Um, and so the important part I guess is here it goes for all of the data that's going to send out. Um, if the letter is in plane, which is an array from down here, then encode it. Otherwise, output the letter. So this one shows plane is like a string that contains all of these characters. And then it sends out this and shuffles the plane. I wonder what version of bash is using. 
Yeah, why is why is that interesting? Oh, yeah. what did I do? Can we execute arbitrary Yeah, like so something like Shellshock, sure there's bash exploits, but if we can just run arbitrary commands on the server, yeah. even if the output's not meaningful to us yet, like it's encoded, we can still potentially do things. Can you run the shuffle command? Uh, can you, can you, well, one thing you would try is because, well, if you already have like arbitrary commands, can you just like type them with your shell and it's like works? Uh, type in the program name, you mean? So what, like, what, what, what is the flag you're looking for? Is it just a flag? Because you're just like, typing in the reverse shell and then you have an unencrypted shell, right? What do you mean by reverse shell? Like the connect back shell. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, so, reverse shell? Like, you mean run a... Uh, run, a, run a command that will like start a shell. Yeah, right. That we can connect back to. to your computer, so you can um, no longer have like garbage out. Yep. Yeah. So that's a clever idea. Do you know how to do that in one line of shell? Uh, no. I always Google. Yeah. So we could like <laughs> use Metasploit or something. But I think there's an easier way. Like the question asked us to find the bugs in their encryption. So the bug in their encryption isn't necessarily that that running shell commands. Like that's a serious problem. But I think we can also. Do it using this. Um, can you keep running it until it's again? Uh, I don't know if I want to wait that long. Hmm. So, where's the shell that we're going to look at? Do we know how many, how many runs it's like? Um, oh, it's back to M. Wow, oh. I just stopped. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 10 or so, but it, the code shows that it shuffles it randomly. Oh, okay. So, like, even though M is the same, it's probably got different for the other characters. So what was the letter that you typed in to get M? Or was it uh, we just typed help. M oh, but no, no, space. Oh, M is space. Yeah. yeah. So you're going to help and go. Right. So what I mean. What about echoing A? What about echoing the alphabet? That'll give you the trend. The the decoding. No, echo A B C D E F G. Yeah. So the the clever observation here is that oh. even though we don't know the key. Um, we can get back effectively the alphabet by typing in the alphabet. So um, we know it's a shell, so we might want to type you know, ls or name or something. And then we can just type something invalid like the alphabet. <laughs> I think last time it was hard to read it when you did that. Um, oh, but I'm in. That was not the right card. Yeah, so what we can do, um, <coughs> ah, so the problem I had last time was that it was hard to see what the alphabet was. So if we did echo like that, so we can clearly see the end when we get the repeated characters. Yeah, so the next thing we can do, like, if you remember from the source code, they showed us all the letters that they used. Like, it's got plain. So what we can just do is run a command we want to get the output of, and then also run this, and then use that to work out what letters substitute to where. Why do you need to ls? Uh, because it's a, a challenge, so we want to run a meaningful shell command that'll help us yeah, can progress. Easy, an easy way, if, 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 if the flag is just a file, you can just do like cat star and then type it to make that. Sure, but what if it's not a file in this directory? Like what if there's lots of files? I, I think ls is a good place to start. Yeah, but like, like I don't know if you need to do the decoding, maybe this is not the fastest way to solve problems. Yeah. But yeah, sure, this is, you know. Oh, what, what are you suggesting? Um, just to like, uh, like you can you can you can get the plain text output of a command if you can if you can like connect the output of another computer then you can just do it by typing the output of the command instead of decoding the output of the command. Right. So I only guess that it's file. Yeah, I think from memory you couldn't do that on oh, yeah. the so competition like, service. So, like, but I think it might work, try yeah. Like, first. Um I think a Python script's just as easy personally. But each to their own. Um, yes. So, 
you know, I think in the competition I tried that and then couldn't connect out or something, but because it's lo running on my local machine I probably can, but... Um, in the spirit of the competition, let's... So this is... Oh, I'll do that. So I'm thinking I can make a, like a challenge in the exact same scenario that doesn't have like, a crypto and still be solved. Yep. Yes, I do. Um, do I need to escape back ticks if they're inside yes, speech marks? Oh, so I'm a single quote. Single quote. Yes. Uh, where the flash and the oh, and escape, escape the, escape. yep, which is this one. Except you can't escape inside single word. Mm. <laughs> you, can Sorry, es you can escape inside double quotes though, right? <laughs> I'm pretty sure you can escape inside double quotes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's escaping the slash, and then that's escaping. The, the slash was next to the double quotes. It doesn't matter as long as we have the same output in our program uh, as we have in here. Okay. Um, we didn't get very much output. But that's the command that's oh, like running it. from the Python, yeah. Might just try. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's definitely doing it. So let's echo this. There we go. So, oh, but of course we don't know where the alphabet starts and ends again, so we can just put in. If it's echo, it should start on the new line. So now that we have this, we can write like a simple script that'll just translate from thing to thing. Ah, uh, go to escape it in Python as well. It's the last part. And then we have our plain text. So we don't need to escape. No, we do need to escape the slash. We do need to escape. Okay, that should be fine. Cool. So um, we can also get a message. which I'll just take the new lines out of so that we can still do it in one line of Python. In the edit, you can replace the new line track. That's true. I'm yeah, going to tool away. The thing I've been doing um, is like, pipe, pipe the output to like slash dev slash fd three. To what? Like slash dev slash fd slash three or something. Like, so you what does that achieve? Like, you can like take the output of the command and pipe it to the files mm -hmm. so that you have um, on the socket. Cool. Um, 
So we want to look up the character in encoded. Forgotten how to do this in Python hmm? from last yeah. week. So we wanted for each character find it in encoded. Yep, so that's the index. So then we want to look in plain this index. Okay, clearly not like that. Might be the other way around. Hmm. So we have is that the same length or is there a um, we have encoded and plain. Uh, Plain's got one more. Ah, <coughs> oh, plain has a back tick before the single quote. That's the Really? Because it's also got a back tick before this quote. Yeah, that. So I imagine it should only. You can just do it with um, maybe just the alphabet. That's not good either. Um, should have sacrificed to the demo gods. <laughs> if you put an R in front of the string in your single quotes, doesn't it um, ignore escape? Could you, could you sort both the strings and then print them out on top of each other? But then... Are you just trying to find the missing letter? If you name know, the new variable, it won't affect the first. But then surely if you sort them and then there's one missing that's in the other one, that one will be shifted off by one after the missing one. But aren't you just trying to find where the missing one is? Yeah. What the missing one is. Uh, is it... Uh, how do you turn a list and in string into a list? List. Yeah. A string into a list. list. Um, sort is a place, so you can do sorted um, ah. as a function, as a function taking for this. No, you just do sorted thing. <laughs> what was the other one called? Encoded. Okay. <laughs> so there's a space in encoded but not plain. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now isn't the space? The space looks a lot of character in the So maybe it's like next to between the X and the up, up, go low. Oh yeah. So we must have just missed it off the plane. Plane. It was the last character. Okay. You missed the um, quotation, <coughs> the single You just go plain plus equals yeah. That's just not fun. Yeah. That's not going to show it anyway. <laughs> 
Cool. All right. So that does print all the characters. So then. We want to look it up and encode it, right? And those look like indexes. Which just means it couldn't find it, which. Oops. Go. That looks better. Okay, so we have K, which must be the first one for like the characters we don't have. So it says bin dev etc flag dot txt lib. Um, caviar. caviar baked shame nine six six. Um, remember we catted star afterwards, and then it says cat bin is a directory, cat dev is a directory. So presumably the only file in this directory was flag dot txt, and this looks like a flag. Um. Can you take back to the source code? Yep. Okay. Um, guys, what's up? We're XPC now. Uh, yeah, five, six, seven, eight. Um, I'm not gonna wait that. Okay. Um, cool. Do you have any thoughts? Or I don't think anyone asked me to do it. Alright, so thinking back to what we've just done here, um, so I guess the key observations, which took a little bit longer to get to than I was hoping, uh, the substitution cipher. So we can tell either from looking at the source how it shuffles the key and matches them, or from experimentation, which we did. And whatever we type, we'll get printed back to us. So if we type the whole alphabet, we can decode it without having to actually find the key. Um, it's running a shell, so we can just cap flag of txt and then success. Cool. All right, so I was going to look at web next, but I think another cool one to look at is this one, which is one of the ones, the random ones, which Neil solved on our theme, so his solution was really cool. So we're given an encrypted bitmap file, and I tell us it's an encrypted bitmap file, and so I guess, what does this mean? How do you encrypt a bitmap file? So the first thing to do might be to Google it and find out, you know, how do you encrypt a bitmap file and then what things can you do to it? And then if we actually look at the file, we can see that the header is encrypted and we can still see patterns in the raw data. So even though we can't necessarily understand it as bytes, we can see that the file has the, the sorts of patterns we'd expect from a bitmap file. So uh, I think I put it in here. So this is what the file's called. So if we count it, we can see it's got soldered in front, which we can Google to find out means some sort of encryption. Um, and then it's got a bunch of bytes that seem to be occurring in patterns. Did not mean to scroll that far. So if we just cut it to the terminal, um, we can see, like, stop, stop, okay. Uh, we can see, like, there are patterns occurring. So, presumably, there's some number of bytes that correspond to one byte in the bitmap file. If you guys remember, if you've done, hmm? Is it four bytes to one pixel? Right. Uh, yeah, so in a bitmap file, you have, have you done 1917 with first semester? Yeah. Yeah, so we have the three bytes for each pixel, which correspond to a red, green, and blue value. And then there's padding. Yeah, padding sometimes. So, what are you guys' thoughts on what we can do here? The header's pretty standard, so it might be worth to see if we've got enough information to encrypt it just for that. Yep, so we could either try and decrypt the header or we could recreate the header for the file. Recreate the header and just display it. Who cares if the colors have been <laughs> yep. encrypted? It'll still be a, the image. I like some random text, like CIDM. I can't see what you're pointing. I think okay. that's just a coincidence. Oh, this one? Yeah, I think this is a coincidence. Okay. 
Um, yeah, so Richard's idea is really good. We can recreate the header file, but even simpler than that, like how can we, like presumably they want us to recreate the header file and research bitmap formats and try and do that ourselves, but how can we even better than that do this without having to do that? And so Maybe Neil- another image that's the same size. And e even simpler than that, without having to do any of this manipulating files. Don't treat it as a BMP. I guess you can treat it as a B, uh, one of those binary coded. There's those other formats. Yeah, well, we just want to look at the picture, right? Oh, yes, it just resize the screen so that it's the um, that it lines up. Yeah, so that's what Neil did. Like, Mac, Mac terminals can scroll really small text, which I can't do in mine. Um, and you can just resize the terminal until it wow. makes a picture. That's great. Did you think of that? Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's awesome. And OS10 terminal, you can zoom out to so like a thousand by thousand terminal. <laughs> So an even easier way, like rather than having to use a terminal, we can just use a program like GIMP and then import it as a raw bitmap file without the header, and it should. Yeah, the observation is like even if it has extra data at the start, this bitmap header, like yeah. as long as you have the correct width, yeah. it's just going to be like offsetting yeah. all the lines by a bit, not going to screw up. That's awesome. What is going on here? CTF, HTTP, aha. It's not working because my screen resolution is smaller than normal. Um, then I think one of these is like raw image data. Yeah. And so now we can just adjust. Can you guys see that? You yeah, sort of can. So you can see there's the data oh, coming fine. up. It'll be on the screen recording. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think it's still going. He might have seen a fraction of it, half of it. You can kind of see lines scrolling. Yeah, I think it should form very clear words once it's working. What if you were nice and chose like the thing might be fine? They might have chosen a standard size. Oops. The excitement's kind of worn off by now. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 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 So that's that square. So cool. So now if we So the height and then just being a problem. Um I think it should have well, No, yeah. Is that it? There's something up in the corner. Does it right. just keep going like to the right? <laughs> uh, let's try opening this and then seeing if we can scroll around. My screen resolution's not very good. Yeah. There we go. Um, and I said because because BMP is like oh yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we can see uh, boxing desktop. Some words. No, that's uh, gutter. Gutter. Seven nine eight. <laughs> cool. Well done. So, what are what are the lessons that we can learn from this one? Think outside the box. Exactly. Oh, I think I even wrote that. I said creative uses of tools. So there's lots of approaches. Like it would have been perfectly valid to do what Richard said and recreate a header file or to make another bit like the same size and copy it. Like that's definitely a valid approach. But often we can be clever and we can be hackers and we can think, what can we do that's even cooler than that? Like scrolling out your terminal and resizing it is ingenious. <laughs> so that's why we keep Neil around. <laughs> um, yes. In general, like you want to be able to solve, you like it's a race to solve the problems, right? So. You want to try like the stupidest, quickest thing first before yep. like trying to do that Cool. For the for the previous one, like I I I, I came up with a thing that yeah. was just like get the payment PID 
and then um, output to that one's SCD out part two. Ah, yeah. so actually hack into the program that's running the... Well, hack, like you can like, access its yeah. files. Cool. Did you solve it? Well, I... No, I just did, was looking trying to do that now. Right. Well. Cool. That's cool. So for those who didn't understand, like, you can... So the way programs work is that you have things called file descriptors which say files that are open and also the terminals, so when you're inputting and outputting from it, and you can actually access these from outside of a program if you know the program's ID, like the process ID. So by attaching, like... Because each shell has a process ID, right? Yeah, and then each program inside the shell will have a process ID as well. So you can actually attach to the one that's running the outside program that shows us the, you know, the plain text stuff we can understand, and then you can write to that file descriptor that'll be on the screen, and then just pipe the output to that, which is... Very so is that is that the you know if you type in your terminal to get it and open up the thing and some numbers come up is that the process ID of that particular instance of GM? Uh, yeah. It is the process ID. Like this? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah that's that's the process ID. Okay, cool. Yeah. Awesome. So if you type uh, ps dash a, you can see what the processes in there are. These. Ah, this is running at the moment. Yeah, so this is on my laptop. So I've got VirtualBox, I've got Chrome, I've got GNOME Control Center, I've got Bash. That's my other terminal. Yeah, Chrome. Yeah, you can like do a one line of the either like looks up your account process ID or like maybe you can even just like assume that the only one Python is running and you just create the account to get the PID of all Python processes. Yeah. Okay, so the CPU cycles through like that really. Yeah, so you have both multiple cores and multitasking on a core. So on a CPU, like if you've got four cores, then each core can run something simultaneously. Yep. But within one single core, you can run, you know, one cycle in each of the programs and then one cycle in each of the programs again. And so it appears that they're running at the really same cool. time. But yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Take operating systems because it's really interesting when yeah. you learn all this stuff. I'm going to. Cool. So. Um, it's seven o'clock, so I think we might wrap up here. But basically, I don't think I have any final slides. I'll put the web stuff up on the internet. Like I was saying, have a strategy, uh, know some common techniques, know what you can use, and then just explore around and think really carefully about what you're doing. Um, think about who wrote the program and what, they, what assumptions they made, and then work out how you can exploit those. Cool. Any questions? Do you want to say anything, Richard? I love this. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> cool. Right. Shall we finish up? Uh, where did my screen recording go? So we can 